So thank you very much. I hope everybody hears me. Uh, I don't know if I, look, I should look at the screen or the stream, screen, sorry. But uh, first of all, I should apologize for my English. I, I don't think you really need to really need to be seen. Um, so first I would like to say I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I can stand, but I'm going to sit right today. Um, I wish to thank Professor Charlotte Greenwood to and the history department for receiving us today. Uh, I wish to thank Edgar to organize this. Uh, no and uh, Chris to have accepted to discuss my paper. Um, initially, I suggested several topics to Edgar. And uh, instead of telling me choose this one or that one, he put them all together and made the title we have here. So actually, I'm pretty capable of uh, treating this title, which is basically the, the, the book, the whole book. So since I was uh, confused and um, I, um, I was, uh, how would I say? I was a coward, so I went back to the sources. So when a historian doesn't know what to do, he goes to the sources. So I chose, basically, I want to insist on two types of sources. The, the survey maps, the initial survey maps of Uganda were, were made uh, in the beginning of the 20th century and the Bataka Land Commission of 1924. Um, before I go into those sources, I'll present briefly the book since this is out, so this is, um, this is the fruit, does it work? No, I'm not sure what it's wrong, there. So this is the fruit of uh, this book, um, which I, so it's the French version came out online, free online, uh, free online uh, in June. The paper version in French will come out almost ready, I assume before Christmas. The English translation is basically done, but it has to be put online and then printed. Uh, we hope to print it also. The paper version we hope will be with the with, um, the fountain. But that will probably take a little time. Um, just for you to know where I'm talking about. So this map, if I've been serious, I'd have done the map especially for you. But actually, I just took one in the book, which is showing something else, which I'm not going to talk about. But just for you to be able to see where Busi Island is, uh, so, so uh, just across from uh, Antibia International Airport, just across the lake to the west, or just full north from um, PG. Um, so it's a probably 10 kilometers long island. So it's not a very small island, but it's not huge either. This was just for the location. To finish on the book, I'll, I'm sharing the draft. I actually don't think it's a, I was looking at it. I don't think it's the last draft. I think there's a one which has been a bit improved, but it'll give you an idea of what the book is about. The first part, the first uh, chapters, first two chapters are basically about the history of Uganda in the early 20th century. Uh, now that I've written it, I think I should have probably done a chapter on what was just before 900 on the, the period uh, the 1880s, 1890s, but since I've been working on them for 20 years, it seemed obvious for me, but I should have done a chapter on that too. Um, so this, these parts are not totally original. Many people have worked on them. I use some sources, some, well, usually French whitewater sources to add a few, but um, it was mostly to, get, to enable people to understand, to, to locate Busi in a more global, uh, history. Then the, the three last chapters are on Busi Island directly. 
Um, so the first question is to understand what what the islands, what status, how, how does the Bugan, what, what is the relation between the islands and the Bugat, Buganda main, mainland? Um, then I focus more on when King Wonga comes to power and the, the very quick changes under that uh, during the, 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 the reign of Wonga, especially since Wonga was going to raid Busi Island in 1886 and chase all the chiefs. And uh, so there's a very important moment for the history of the island in 1886. Um, and uh, then I'm going to go back to what the um, what people are fighting. What, what are the what is the land quarrel in Busi Island uh, in the 1920s and the early 20th century? Initially, the chapter five is the first one I wrote, and I meant to do an article with it. And it was a bit big for an article. Then I realized nobody was understanding anything I was saying because it was too dense. So that's why I added up all the rest to try to make it clearer. Um, so that, that was just to, to, to get, give you an idea of uh, the book as a as, 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 oh. And my English is really bad. I haven't spoken in public in English for quite a while. Um, So this book, what was in this book, if you want me to summarize more briefly, um, the, my first idea was the maps. I wanted to work on those cadastral maps and, um, and I wanted to, so they show the property. So I wanted to show how, what, what is the impact of private property on a small island where private property was unknown. It's a global subject, you can find it all over the world. At different times, but in Uganda it happens in nine, in Uganda it happens in nine hundred. And then I got too carried away. Uh, so this island is given to Apurukagua, well given taken by Apurukagua. Um, and uh, so I used uh, administrative sources in Britain and here in Nakasero uh, in, uh, in Wandegea. I've used missionary archives. Protestant Catholics, but the, there is a lot, you can see on the map that the missionaries are there, but it's not missions, They're, they have catechists there. There are no, there's no missionary settlement on the island. Uh, I use the usual the Ganda writings from the early 20th century. Um, and the cadastral maps I've mentioned. What I found very interesting, and it's the case in most uh, history are the commissions of inquiry. We have three commissions of inquiry that mention slightly or more or less this island. The first one is the 1892 uh, Commission of Inquiry on the causes of the war in Uganda, in Uganda about the war between the Catholics and the Protestants. There's a small clash just before the war uh, where I put the arrow from Tebe that placed Wanga and the Gabunga fought about the, uh, for that area just in 1891. So the, uh, during the Commission of Inquiry, people are telling, ex trying to explain what happened on the island. Um, the island was supposed to be Protestant. But then we have another one in 1906, which is uh, the, the Morris Carter uh, Land Commission. They don't really mention Busi, but many of the people are going to be asked questions in 1924, already present there, and they give different versions. It's interesting to see how what they say in 1906 and what they say in 1924. And the, most, and the most important one for me is uh, the one from 1924. So Commission of Inquiries are interesting because they're asking questions to people we don't always hear. And that's it's also a way of having African voices. So of course, it's a very formal situation. Um, so basically what I find, if to summarize the, the main findings, is uh, that the, the role of the islands in Buganda Kingdom is at the same time forgotten and misunderstood. Um, that's the first part. Uh, why is it forgotten and misunderstood? First of all, because the people from the mainland take power in 900. Well, let's say when Wanga falls in 1899, the, 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 the Christian oligarchy, what's the word? How do you say it again? Oligarchy. Oligarchy. 
uh, is uh, mostly people from the mainland. And then it's colonial rule, which is just standardized, simplifies administration. They forget the specificities of the lake. They just treat the lake as if it was the mainland, which and when actually under the, the kings, it was two distinct types of administration. Uh, and then of course, the sleeping sickness, which leads to the destruction of those societies. The societies are totally destroyed by the sleeping sickness. The places are evacuated, the boats are sunk, uh, many people die also. So the, the lake culture is destroyed by the, the way the colonial power will manage the sleeping sickness. It's a case, uh, it's case in the Soga, it means wider, in a wider area. Uh, the, 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 the rest, that area is also important for private property because the first land, the most coveted, coveted, coveted lands in, uh, in, uh, in Buganda were the region around the Bengal, around the capital, and the lake shores and island. The first ones to go were those. The people grabbed that land first, and then they started thinking about other areas. So what we have to understand is in the N900, that was the best prime estate you could get or the islands or the shores. And then they stopped being interesting once the sleeping system, the sleeping sickness arrived. So these areas were very hard hit by private property because everybody wanted a piece of them. So the, local, the locals of course got more, um, more, more, um, more excluded than in other areas. So of course people got excluded everywhere since you have several thousand landowners for maybe a million inhabitants. But that area was very hard hit. Then the third aspect is the question of, the, of a new religious party, which would be the Bataka Federation. But you have to understand the Bataka Federation, I'm not inventing this, the Bataka Federation is linked to the Malaki Church, even though everybody from the Bataka Federation is not in the Malaki Church. So it's one of these new religious parties which are contesting uh, the Catholic, the Muslim, and the Protestant party. Actually, it's a session from the Protestant party, which all well, that is known. Um, but what's interesting is that many of the leaders come from Lucy Island. And actually, um, you will realize that many, the, the people from the islands that were expelled from the islands and the shores are numerous in the, in the Malaki party, in the Bataka party. They, the Malaki is, was born, the man who gives his name to the Malaki church was born on Busi Island. His successor was born on Busi Island. Uh, so we were at the heart of that movement. And more globally, the islands and the shores are, uh, it's among them that among the exiled population of the islands and the shores that will be recruited many, many activists of the Bataka movement. Um, so that's globally to give you an idea of the, of the general background. Um, so let me go back to uh, this map, this map that I'm showing. So I would have liked to take a picture of the whole maps, but it's there, 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 what, there are six maps, I think. I forgot where I wrote it. So actually it's easier to draw it and it's a slightly simplified. Uh, not all the name, place names are on it, but basically it's the, the information of the series of land maps, the first series of land maps that, uh, that, uh, that cover Busi Island. So the, that map is from 1923. It's a fairly late map because the survey was stopped because of the sleeping sickness in 1906. So that's actually very uh, regretful. I've, I was really focused on these maps, but I probably should have chosen another area which was mapped uh, earlier. Because if you just go across where you see where I marked mainland 1.7, you get to a place called Ziva. The maps were done before the sleeping sickness or just at the beginning of the sleeping sickness. They're much richer in details. You have, they, say, they tell you where the trees are. They say, okay, this Shamba is abandoned. Uh, it's much richer information as in 24. They're doing it very quickly, very systematically, and much of the, the local information is absent. Uh, so I probably should have chosen another area. Um, these survey maps, cadastral maps, are very rare for Africa. 
there are very few places where we can find some. Usually, a cadastral maps will be found in um, settlers areas. So let's say South Africa, Kenya, where, where the colonial powers wanted to put settlers, they, they drew those maps, or in towns. But here we have maps that cover rural areas. So that's it's, it's quite, quite unique for Africa. I think it's probably, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the only case in Africa. So the, those, those maps are very interesting for us. Um, they, what is interesting is the idea came from the British, but the actual dividing of the land was done by the Baganda authorities. Uh, the British only came, the British administration only came in for the mapping and the registration. But basically the sharing out of land, the first types of sketch we don't have were made by the Luchico uh, and settled by, the conflicts were settled by the Luchico. So even then the, the, colonial, the colonial authorities don't interfere so much in the way the land is going to be divided. So of course, uh, the great Christian chiefs are the one who control this whole thing. Um, so, well, you probably know these things. So it's about 17% of Uganda, which is concerned with these maps as a whole of Uganda, including the, the, the future lost counties. The maps are, so they're surveyed between nine, 904 to uh, 1936. It's lots of work, it's expensive. Uh, and they have, it's complicated. It, it takes much longer than, than, than they ever anticipated. And in the end, you have hundreds of maps of one ten, one, one, uh, one ten thousand. Uh, they, when I saw them, they were in Antibe on the land survey. I'm not sure where they are today. They were moved, but I guess they're at the land survey somewhere. Hopefully they haven't been lost because they've uh, numerized the more recent maps. So I don't know what happened to these old maps. Um, so yes, six. There's this. This summarizes six maps. The problem is initially the dates weren't on the maps, so I didn't know when the maps were made when I found them. It's only very late that I realized they were from 1923. I thought they were much more recent, much older. I thought they were from 1906 or something. Um, so I was disappointed. Uh, this reflects property 20 years after the, the initial sharing out of land on this island. But uh, there's very few changes. A couple of changes I could show you uh, maybe a bit later. But basically, because, um, because of the sleeping sickness, because the um, people like Kagwa did not want to sell their land, they wanted to buy more land, but they didn't want to, to split their land. You really have to wait for the 1920s and mostly 30s for these these, um, these estates to be broken up. So basically this map is very close to what happened initially, but we have other sources to, to know what happened initially. Another interesting point is that these, um, these methods are very modern and the, the British were not using them in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, this, this first type of map, are invented, well, they're, they're, you can find Roman maps and things like that, but uh, let's say the, this kind of, this type of, of survey maps are invented in northern, in the North, northern Italy kingdoms in the 18th century. Napoleon spreads them up all over the Europe, but the British resisting, they don't get contaminated. So, so they don't get the, the systematic, systematic mapping of property in, in the UK. And actually, I don't think they, maybe they have, some now since the 90s, but actually I don't think the British have it today. So the, 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 this, these methods are more modern than what was being done at the same time in the UK. The UK will be using methods that come from India, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and Australia. So actually it's, a, the, 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 it's more an imperial method than a British method. method. There's a kind of a colonial modernity in this case. And then you have circulations of practices inside the empire, which are not practiced in the in the in the, in the in Great Britain. Um, so what's interesting is 
that private property did not exist in Uganda before 900. And then, um, so Milo is like very similar to private property up until the 1928, when it becomes a dual property. But for the for, for this period, it's basically one owner. It's the, the Kiban, the, there's not the Kibanja question at the before 1928. Um, land tenure rights existed in Uganda, but they weren't, there wasn't a market. So there wasn't, um, you couldn't buy and sell land. Again. If you wanted to have land, you had to go through your kins, you had to go through patronage, through friends. Uh, it wasn't sold, bought and sold. So that's a major difference. And uh, on the, there were multi multiple uh, rights on the same parcel. The private property gives a, an exclusive right uh, to one person that can sell it. Before that, you had many, many people who could say they had rights on the same piece of land. That's one of the big issues with pro private property because they'll make one person happy and 100 or 200 people very unhappy. Um, the, these maps are, tell us a little bit about what existed before, but not so much. First problem is they're showing the, the property of chiefs, not the property of the people actually tilling the land. So we don't actually see the, 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 the banana uh, uh, trees. We don't see the, the, the plantations. We see what the chiefs claim. And even also in this case, Kagwa takes everything. But even, uh, sorry, so we took uh, Yuna Majera, who was the, one of the, Bata, the, the Mutakas of the island. Even in this case, the, they didn't respect the borders. Uh, the, when they uh, surveyed the land, they wanted straight lines because that's easier, quicker to draw. They didn't want to have spaces between owners. Uh, some people, since you know, it was, they were given paper milo. So they, they had a certain amount of land, but they didn't know where that land was. So they didn't want leftovers. So some people, misestimated their land, so they had to be reduced. Others underestimated it, so they added a bit. So there's a kind of game which means that even when you have a former landowner, not landowner, a former occupier, the limits are not, or don't have to be the ones that he had before that. And in this type of map, but not as not always in other maps, all the landscape, the you know, people had, like say trees marking the landscape, they don't appear on that map, but they could appear in Ziba just on the other side. Um, the other th question, the other thing is um, you, the, the, the system was oral and it became written, well, written maps. Let's say maps are a type of writing. And as soon as you transform a reality from oral to written, you are changing the nature of the, the, the object. That's true for land, it's true for, for law, for everything. To make things worse, so it's not only a question of property, it's a question of passing from oral to written. Uh, so when, the, when you pass from oral to written, there's also a signification. So let's say lots of name places have disappeared in the map compared to what people remember. Um, and then there's a problem of, um, how do you translate legal English, legal, legal land law from English to Luganda? Actually, it's impossible. The, the, during the whole period, colonial period, the land office says they are trying to translate, but those words don't exist. So basically, I guess today, people the, they speak Luganda and use these terms, but they borrowed them from English and they understand what they mean. But initially, they, have, so they haven't been translated, they've been, adopted. So you have to understand that the, the, during the whole colonial period, 99% of the people who are in charge of managing land don't cannot read and understand the legal text behind the land. Yeah. Um, so that also explains why there's so much confusion. The laws are not understandable by the people who are, who are uh, whose, whose laws are being used on and by the people who are supposed to uh, administrate those laws. So there's, there's an oral transmission, of course, but clearly these things are not, cannot be translated. 
and were not translated. Another original aspect is usually when a, a, a country, a kingdom, a state decides to uh, survey land, it's for tax reasons. If you go into the Bible, they mention it. Uh, the Bible says, no, you should never do that. It's because it's taxes. Uh, but not in this case. In this case, it's only to know who owns what. It's not to take taxes on the, actually chiefs don't usually pay taxes in that manner. There are a few taxes that come later, but initially uh, it's not for tax reasons. So that makes it very strange to spend so much money and not get tax returns. It's a very original case. Um, and the, the, so I already mentioned the other uh, strange thing is they've gone to all these expense, but not to give the land to settlers, but to give the land to the local chiefs. So that's also quite uh, rare. Or you can have large plantations eventually, but that's not the case. So probably Johnston thought that eventually this land would, there would be a land market and the land would be bought by settlers. But his plan miscalculated because the, the model is so complicated that they didn't manage to set, to solve these questions before independence. Basically, Milo is being used to buy land today, but the British wanted it, wanted to be able to buy land a century ago and didn't manage. So let's say it took a century for their, their methods to, to bear fruit. And then the other surprising thing is that so often when you decide to, to divide land, it's because there's lots of population pressure. Let's say in the 50s, in the uh, Kisi Highlands uh, above Kisumu, there's very high density of population. And that's why the British decide to test dividing up land there. But it's not the case in Buganda. Buganda's population is crashing at that point. Between 1850 and 1930s, the population is going down. It's not going up. So there's not more pressure on the land. There's rather less pressure on the land than before. So there again, we have a strange, strange case. Um, let me now get get into the. Okay, can we actually even show you the other document? We'll go back to them. We'll go back to the map and we'll go back to this document, but I'll try to explain to you the, um, uh, the, the type of documents. So this is the 19, 1924 Bataka Lands Commission. Um, so Holy Hansen studied it very precisely. Let's say in the 20s, the colonial power is under a lot of pressure. The discontent in Buganda and Uganda globally is very high. There's been the war, there's been epidemics. The colonial system basically is not working anymore and they're trying to reform. Uh, the Bataka uh, Federation mobilizes, does petitions, sends a letter, goes to see the governor, writes to London, use the press, uh, so they're using all these kind of legal modern means to pressure the colonial government and the royal government. Uh, and the colonial government is, has to react because the Ganda, the Luchiko and the king, can, the king tries to act. Actually, the king is becoming adult. That's actually a major uh, aspect is that is now adult and uh, he wants to, he should take over from Kagwa. But Kagwa is not letting them. Uh, so the the the, the Ganda structures, the Ganda structures are not managing to reform, and so the British decide, or London decides that the, the British colonial uh, authorities should do uh, an inquiry and figure out what's going on. So they'll hear sixty-four witnesses, great pump with the you know the opening is the Karaka is there, the governor is there. The, the huge the band is there. I mean, it's they're they're making a big show of it. They listen to sixty four witnesses, and then they give they they should have given their opinion. So they give a small opinion and ask London, and then London doesn't answer, doesn't answer. And two years later, London says, "Yes, 
uh, you're right, this, this was mis mishandled, but we won't change anything. So the, this is a big show, but nothing happens. But for us, it's convenient since we have the, the people testifying and we have the transcript. So the transcripts are kept in London at the, at the, public, at the National Archives. The original, those in London, they have the translation, the type translation, the manuscript translation, and the Luganda versions were here, uh, on TV, rather, but they've been lost. Uh, maybe they'll appear again, but at the moment they're not there anymore. The only, um, the only thing is the Apolokagua, since he was the first accused, copied a lot of the, the took notes or had copied the documents. So there, part of it is at Macquarie University in Pagua's paper. The, so you have part of the Luganda version, which Pagua got copied uh, here in Macquarie. So if you want to check translations, that's going to be. Um, when you look at the document globally, so it's a very long, it's a very big document, several hundred pages. Even though I'm giving you just a very small extract here, um, you realize that half the cases are on the lake. So it's about the lake shore. The Basisi are about the Basisi, the people from the lake. Uh, constitute half the, the the cases, and the other half deals with other areas in Uganda. Uh, th so this was the first surprise. So half of it, half of it on Lake and uh, Shores, and ten on the Busi Island. So this was a quite uh, surprise since they're really overrepresented. They most of them had been killed by the sleeping sickness, and they were deported. And here you have. There's only a small part of Uganda, and they're the ones complaining. Um, though those documents are interesting also because people lie. Of course, when you're pleading a case, you want to win your case. You're not there to tell the truth. You're there to, to win a case. So of course, people lie, Kagwa lies, the other ones lie. Uh, that's normal. But it does give you an indication of, okay, so there's several people you can confront versions of that, so that's the normal thing. But it's also, when somebody is lying, he, does, he isn't lying randomly. He's lying with arguments he thinks are the good arguments and arguments which will work. So even a lie is interesting. Um, then, they're often talking about the past, not in this extract, but often they'll say, okay, this piece of land was given to us by the Kabaka at this time, at, at the King, King, King Tu or whatever. Uh, but you always have to understand that when people are discussing about the past, they're actually speaking about the present. So that's a, it's both ways. And then you have the production of rival histories. They're writing histories which are competing with each other. You have two versions of history which are fighting. Um, so Holy Hansen has insisted that the great chiefs like Kagwa, the, those, those great Christian chiefs were actually inventing a history where they were in, taking the, the way the colonial system was functioning or colonial chiefs were function, were the powers of the colonial chiefs and were transferring it, transferring them to the past. Um, so that's what she says, it's, it's probably true. You can also see other things that there are, actually that's, she also says this, that there are two visions of Buganda history which are being discussed in this uh, hearing. One is that Buganda was ruled by a despotic king which ruled without hearing it, just at his whim, with lots of authority and nobody could discuss what he wanted. And then you have another version which is that there was a peaceful monarchy where the kings and the clans ruled peacefully and justly the, the kingdom of Uganda. So you have these, either the king is a very powerful, violent uh, despot, despot, or you have this kind of peaceful relation between the king and the clan chiefs. So of course, I, the, the, the Kagwa is, has the, the version of the despotic king and the Bataka have the other version, which, which is obvious. Uh, then she also explains that you have two forms of speeches, one which is uh, addressed to the British and one which is addressed 
to the other baganda, which are numerous. There's a crowd. They, they, they're holding their, their hearings at uh, Old Kampala, I believe. And there's a crowd outside listening. So the pl place is packed and there's people everywhere listening. So the double speech, one for the British, one for the, the baganda. Um, so one which is uh, very uh, ill-defined with a past which is very ill-defined and idealized for the British and one which is very precise for the Baganda, saying this right, this king, this obligation. Uh, so the later aspect is very continuation to what we can find for 19th century. That's how people dealt with these issues before colonial rule. Mm -hmm. um, when we focus on Busi Island and on the people testifying for Busi Island, we can see that uh, there are three types of people. They're the old chiefs, which are not very schooled, which are not very accustomed to, 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 to the capital. Uh, they're not very accustomed to the ways to behave and to speak. So old people, old, small, not great chiefs, small chiefs, small island chiefs. Then you have very young, very educated people uh, who, who have been to the to secondary school or to have, I mean, some have been further than secondary school. Uh, Malaki, uh, Malaki has been to, he was a catechist. So people who are trained in the modern uh, education system and which are in the Bataka system, uh, Bataka Federation also. Uh, and they have never, they didn't experience pre-colonial times. They're too young. So the times they're talking about are times they don't know. And they're imagining a new uh, pre-colonial history that they never experienced. And then you have the, the oligarchs, Polokagua, uh, Stanislas Muguanya, who are self-taught. They haven't been to school, but they're self-taught. And um, they are very um, at ease in the two worlds. They know how to, um, they know how to, uh, to, to plead in justice. They know how to uh, please the British. Um, and there are people who have been selected. Initially, these people were chosen in the 1890s because they knew how to talk. That was one of maybe more than their war skills, the way they knew how to talk and judge was an essential element that made them become these very, very powerful men. Um, so there again, when you see the number of people from the lake, the types of speeches which are being developed, um, you realize that what is actually people like Malaki, what are they, what, what they're doing is they're actually taking what they remember of the way the lake was being administered and this saying that that's the way the whole of Uganda was being administered. So he's saying this is, he remembers how Busi was administered with the clans being very important, et cetera. And there he says, this is how Uganda was in the past. That was how like uh, Chagwe was in the past, like, like Singo was in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're building a new history, not uh, where they say before Uganda was a very nice and peaceful place. It was ruled by the clans. And then these people like Kagwa and Disputs came around and chased this good governance, good, good government, and brought us uh, this kind of misrule that we have today. But what's interesting is yeah, the speech is historical. They're not saying the Basisi were ruled this way, the Baganda were ruled this way. They're saying that the, the, Bas, the, the old Uganda was like they're projecting in the past the, the islands as if it was the historical Uganda. Um, and this kind of speech is the one, if you go do oral history, usually that's what you're going to collect today. Because the, Bata the Bataka Federation will lose the fight, but they'll lose, they win the mines. So their vision of the, the vision they invent in this conflict to fight Kagwa, who's the master of the, the you know, he writes the kings, he writes, he's the master of the, 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 the history of Uganda. So they fight him by inventing this new history inspired by the, the islands, though they don't say it's the islands, they say it's the past of Uganda. 
And that's often, when you go interview people, that's often the type of history you'll get with them. Because they run the mines, but they lost the case. Um, I don't know, how long have I been talking? Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes ago. So let's go back to my documents. Here you have the island of Busi. Um, uh, Apollo Kagawa gets most of the land, most of the land. So you see there's a few places he doesn't get. Initially, uh, in the first, the, at the beginning, when they were sharing out the land, this land was not Apollo Kagawa's. Apollo Kagawa had other land in Busiro. Uh, this land went, was for the, the Gabunga, which uh, was the head of the Mamba clan and became the, the Saza chief, the Kweba the Saza chief of the Sisi Islands. So initially the Gabunga took over this island, which was supposedly already his, at least since 1886, since the Mwanga had given him the island, the island in 1886, with a few exceptions. Uh, but Ga the Gabunga realized that he'd become a Saza chief and he had to mark his mile, cut his miles on the Sisi Islands. So he abandoned this area, which wasn't in the Saza, which is in Busiro. And uh, at the same time, so he transfers his miles to the Sisi Islands. At the same time, there's a big mess in, uh, around Kampala and in Busiro because uh, the, the Luchiko gave the land around the royal tombs to the dead kings. They decided that the owners of the, the Milo uh, around the Kasuri, Ramallah, all these numer numerous tombs belonged to the dead kings. And the British, when they got the, the information said, no, you cannot give land to a dead person. It has to be somebody alive. So Kagwa and the Luchiko and Mogo were trying to find a solution. And the solution they found was to, re, to bring back all the royal family to uh, the Lucero and, and give the land to descendants of the king. So princesses, usually it's the Malinia or people from descendant of those kings. But then that meant they had to give them more land. So that means they had to chase other people and they had to make place for this royal family being set. They were used to be settled across the kingdom. And now they're all settled in Busiro, which is already very crowded. There's lots and lots of butacas in Busiro. The capital is just beside. So there's a, they need to have to make place and people like, even people like Pagua have to abandon a lot of their land in Busiro, most of their land in Busiro. He's not the only one, many people have to do that. And Kagwa is delighted because he has, he has these miles which he had cut in Busiro. He doesn't have place anymore. He doesn't want to go and cut them way above where, the, where, the, where let's say in, uh, close to Bunyoro, where it's dry and the bananas don't grow, there's nobody. And he sees this island, which is, yeah. he sees the islands are free. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the connection still working or not? <laughs> but you can maybe continue. In our so office. I was saying that the, the island had been uh, is taken over by by uh, since uh, he had to abandon some land in the zero. Though it seems that he took more land than, than he had abandoned. So, and probably more land than what the, 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 the Gabunga had taken. Um, what's interesting here is actually why he did, why didn't he take everything? So, Yona Majera, oh, you see him there, he's the only one who was there before. He was the most important Mutaka of the island. He's from the Mamba clan. He's also Protestant, uh, but he's also one of the, uh, one of the people who was complaining in 1924. So even though he got a small piece of the island, less than a mile, he's not. He isn't happy about it. Uh, I could, so he 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 claims that uh, his Mutaka was much wider before Agua came and squeezed him. Um, another interesting, so Yunnan Tsubuga, this is an interesting case. Yunnan Tsubuga uh, actually bought this piece of land, uh, but it's a very complicated case. 
So you, I remind, the, you remember that the Gabunga uh, had uh, first taken the island and then moved to the Sesi Islands. But actually he had kept a small a mile just here where I have it written on Tibet four miles, which is called the, the most strategic part on the island. He kept a mile there and it's not on the map. What happened is he exchanged with Kagwa this mile for this mile here. Because they're both people from the Mamba clan, it's not very clear what's going on between them. One, uh, Yunam Tsuruga is the son of an uh, important Catholic chief. chief. Yunam Tsuruga, Yunam Tsuruga is going to die young, but he's a very educated, he's a, he was a very promising Catholic chief in the time. He dies very shortly afterwards. So, you know, he fought in the First World War, he's very educated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's actually the, the, the transaction actually start in 900, but it will take a few years before they're settled. And they and the, to to convince Kagwa to sell, the Gabunga is, has to relinquish his his land, uh, which is much more interesting. This is the best most. Of, this is uh, where Kagwa puts his headquarters. Uh, and Yuna um, Musuga's father is a very important important chief. He has money, he has wealth, so he can pay. He's the, the county chief for the Bubuma Islands. And he used to be a county chief in, uh, in 900, he's a county chief in Bubu. Not a county chief, a sub county chief in Bubu. So he has cash. He can, he can afford, that's the place he was born. So he's buying back his birthplace, which has a sacred site. I haven't figured out what the sacred site is. But it's very strange to see Catholics and Protestants very faithful Catholic and Protestants who are actually trying to preserve this pagan site. So if you go there today, there's a huge sabo in the at the crossway. Even though they're permanent Catholic families. Uh, so that explains why this piece of land is here. Um, the other famous case is Mikasima Timba. Mikasima Timba is a Christian of the first generation. He's the most traveled of his generation. He goes to Zanzibar, he goes to Mombasa, he goes to England. Uh, there's several papers, John Rowe has written about him. And uh, he, uh, I think as a, second. Walker says he's the most British of, the, of, their, of, the, of their converts. So he's the same generation as Kagwa. And he goes to the, and he, this, he's probably the first person to buy land. So he has, he bought this property before the 900 agreement. So he says that he was given, this land was given to him by Mutesa. And then he bought it again from Wonga. So, and um, in the 18, after you have the religion wars in 1892, the Catholics are chased from, from Mengo, from Ubaga, Ubaga is burnt. Um, and after the negotiations, the missionaries come back and lots, lots of the land they were occupying has been grabbed by the Protestant chiefs. But they come out with papers signed by Mutesa, signed by Wanda, saying that this land is theirs. And the British see the papers and they say, okay, this land is theirs. And they tell the Protestant chiefs to go, which is very rare. Protestant chiefs usually have the upper hand. And there are these uh, vanquished priests come with paper and they can make them give up their land. So Kagwa is furious. And immediately after, that's when they realize that these papers are important. And immediately afterwards, they force Mwanga to give land to the Protestant missions, but also they force him to sell land to Kagwa. Kagwa will buy a big lot of junk of Sambia at that point for nothing. And Mwanga is obliged to sign. And then and a few years later, the British start to try to figure out who, what land has been sold. So in 1906, they come and register this land. So um, Becca Sibatimba bought land from Mwanga, and so he can go and get it registered in 1896. So when Kagwa wants to seize the whole island, he's told that he cannot take that part because it's already been sold. It's deducted from Mekasimatimba's Milo, but uh, Kawa cannot take it. So that's why he has a small island here. 
And we got uh, Sumatimba has landed in other places. He was uh, he was a sub chief in uh, he was the Makamba, which was a sub chief at first in Busiro. Then he was chased out of Busiro and he was a sub chief. He became a sub chief uh, of the Burma Islands. He's an important Protestant, powerful Protestant. Though him and Kagua don't get along. That's another part we can see. And then you have the the, the church land, the White Fathers, and the Ten minutes. Okay, so well, uh, I continue with this. The, you have the church land, uh, the the Protestants and the Catholics. If you look at the map carefully, you'll see that they're not at all settled at the same place. The simplest is the White Fathers. So the White Fathers. This is a Protestant area. So before 900, they cannot settle there. When they put a catechist, he is chased. There's a trial that is chased. The 900 agreement enables them to put land for their Catholics, even in Protestant areas. But you'll note they're all on the side of the water. What, what the objective for the White Fathers is actually to have a stopping point for the Catholic Basisi because in, in the main island in the Basisi Islands is Catholic. So the question is for them when they go and serve in Antebe, uh, in, uh, in Port Bell, or further down at Kisumu, they need stopping points. But Antebe has been grabbed by the British. So they don't have any place to stay in Antebe. Lots of the places where the Basisi could stop and have land and farms and food and just places to sleep in have disappeared. So there they're trying to make sure that the Basisi stop where there's a Catholic catechist who can make sure they don't go to see pagans or Protestants. And also because it's a very dangerous job, so there's storms, the boats sink. So they need uh, you need to they Catholics are making rituals to replace the pagan rituals. So that's why they're strat they're, they're all on the side of the water. The Protestants have been there. Actually, the Protestant map shows where the Protestants settled in 1894. All these places were actually taken in 1894 and then registered um, in 900. So you see a bigger piece of land. Uh, here in the middle for the because they actually have an African minister and smaller pieces for for uh, capitalists. Actually, the this place is settled on a former sacred site. They they gave the they, they built the church where the, there was probably a, a pagan temple before that. And so there is one piece of land which is a bit strange. I don't know if you've noticed. That there's a, a, a bizarre piece of land on this map. What 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 shouldn't be there? Kagua is grabbing land, and there's one piece of land that seems to have resisted strangely. It's the crown land. Why is that piece of crown land that there? It shouldn't be there. Kagua can take any. So initially, I thought maybe there was some kind of thing, you know, a kind of an outpost that they wanted to control to watch over for Antebe because it's a major town. But it's not, I went there, and that's not the case. It's not, there's nothing strategic about it. Uh, and actually, this piece of land is the most uh, desired piece of land of the whole island. This is what, we well, probably won't have time to go into details in it. On it, this is what they're fighting about in this place. So this piece of land is called the um, Kisaba. Not get it wrong. It's Kisaba. It's Butaka of the Gate Land, and uh, their function is to give beer to the Kabak. Every two months, they're by rotation. They're in charge of bringing beer to the Kabak every two months. It's a specific beer with made with Bugoya banana, bananas, which is not the usual type of banana. It's an exceptional beer. And it's an exceptional place because so you have the beer, which basically everybody's trying to grab that piece of land. Every time the Nuka Galunga comes, he tries to grab it. In the 19th century, they're all fighting for that piece of land. So you have this exceptional beer, which really seems to be very, very good. It doesn't exist anymore. I wish I could drink it, but. It's not there anymore. Then, of course, the land is extremely fertile. And then you have boats, you have fishing grounds. Many of these 
this attack has maybe seemed small, but actually they control fish as well. So that's why it's not so much that they have a land in well, they have a land in fish. But these ones also have a land in, in land. So it's a very, very precious place. That's where Malaki is born. Um, but the land was given to a man called uh, Kuluji, who was the, uh, the treasurer of Kabaka Mutesa and Kabaka Mwanga until Kagwa took over from him. Actually, he's the protector, the initial protector of Kagwa. He's the one Kagwa was serving before Kagwa became the big man and the relation inverted. So they fight in 87, 8, 1887, they have a big quarrel, but in 1890s, they're, they're close friends again. So he, he's the patron, he was the, the patron of Kagwa and Kagwa is still protecting him after. So when, he, when um, uh, Kuruji asks for the place, his place of birth, Kagwa gets it to, gets it to him. But it's more complicated than that because that piece of land was also given to him by Kabaka Mwanga. Because in 1886, when Kabaka Mwanga raided the island, chased his sister who owned the island, the Masolo, chased money of the, the Bataka, gave it to the Gawunga. Uh, Kuruji went and pleaded for his Bataka and it was given back to him. But it meant it was given back to him. It was his birthplace, but not given back to the former uh, Mutaka, not, uh, not, uh, see, Mutaka. So there's actually several buta Mutakas on the same Mutaka. There are actually several people serving the king. There was a hierarchy, but the hierarchy has changed. The Malaki's family was higher up, but after 86, it's actually Malaki's, uh, not Malaki, uh, Kuluji's family, which is higher up. Actually, it's Kuluji, which is higher up. And so they disputed for, for 20 years. But with his connection to Kagwa, he gets the money. Um, but here comes the sleeping sickness. The British evacuate everybody and do a, they want to actually make a forest reserve of the evacuated areas. Uh, the, everybody on Busi refuses, they have to leave, but they keep the land titles except him. Why does he accept? Probably because Malaki is making suing him. So actually, when you're being sued, one way is to run away. You sell the land and you go. So whatever happens, even if you lose the, 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 the trial, well, the land is gone. So he gives the land to the British, and that's why it's crown land. But this text here is fascinating, and I'll stop on this because Malaki is accusing not only Kuluji of grabbing the land, but he says it's not Kuluji, it's Kagwa, because Kagwa from the start wanted to grab this extraordinary estate. And he's denying that it's crown land, even though we can see it's crown land. Kagwa cannot give back crown land. He could have prevented it from going, but once it's gone, it's gone. And you have this Malaki who is. Furious, you can see his suffering. The, the pain in Malaki, and you can see it in other things. He's uh, he's being torn apart. But here he is fighting for a place that he's describing as wonderful, fertile, rich. But it was so in 900. But in 1924, this is a terrible place. It's forest. The the trees have grown in 20 years. Tropical forest is very thick. You need huge labor to conquer it again. It's full of animals. Of mosquitoes, people complain they're get, getting stung all over the place. So actually, when they're fighting for it, it's become a very bad land nobody wants. But still, he, in his mind, he's accusing Kagwa of taking it, which is not the case, and he's imagining it still as it was 20 years ago. And you see, they, they don't mention the sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness is there, but they very seldom speak about it. Uh, so I'll stop on this. I'm saying how um, we can see how uh, the, the Bata so Malaki is one of the leaders of the Bataka movement and of the Malaki church. Kagwa is a leader of the opposite church, of the opposite party. They're really fighting Kagwa. They want him down. There's also these personal quarrels, these, these quarrels which are very intimate. Uh, and, and you can see how Malaki is also almost possessed He's not in the real world anymore. He's just so furious, so, so pain, he, the pain is so much for him that uh, he's lost 
is sort of the, 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 the reality. But Malak is also an extremely fanatical man. And he'll be arrested a few years later. And when she had been arrested a bit, for, a bit earlier, put to jail, refused, refused, stayed naked, refused uniforms, refused to eat, was free. And then when he's arrested again in 1928, he does the same thing, and there they let him die. So many of the people actually you see in this movement, the, the Bataka movement, actually initially they're supported by the British who are fed up with Kagwa also. They want to get rid of Kagwa, but once Kagwa is out, many of them will finish in jail or dead. And I'll stop on this point. Thank you so much for for that, even through the, uh, the network interruptions and power power interruptions. Uh, so, Christopher, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much, and what a fascinating talk. Uh, by Henry. Um, so I'm glad that I have this opportunity to uh, give uh, some comments. Um, and in your opening remarks, you mentioned that this, when the English version of the book comes out. Um, locally here it might be published by Fonte. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good thing for those of us who have been advocating to have this kind of content around here. So that's a good thing and it will be affordable. Um, I should also um, mention that I'm one of those who have been um, making noises about decentering uh, the history of Uganda. Uh, because it is so Uganda centered. And so then you end up having the history of Uganda as Uganda. But then this work tells us so much about Uganda, tells us so much on a subject about Uganda, but which we knew so little about. So this is not the issue of Uganda that we read. This is not the issue of Uganda that we teach or we've been taught in schools. This is a different Buganda. Um, when we talk about Uganda, nobody goes about the, talks about the islands. It's always the mainland, the mainland. So this is not the usual narrative of Uganda and Buganda. So, and for that, um, again, I brought um, this kind of work. Following on that comment, so, about land grab and probably later uh, if we have time i i will be interested in uh, in hearing um was this the language uh, land grab was this the language um of those of people like malaki uh where they calling it land grab but that's something um different but i wanted to say um this conversation about land the way you narrated it, the way you talked about it, what is happening in that book, which I've had an opportunity to look at, um, it complicates the kind of smooth narrative about Buganda agreement, because in Buganda agreement, at least the way we've been reading it, the way it is presented also, they signed an agreement, so and so to this land. So, so like it is peaceful, like there is no contestation but then in this work and in this talk, um, you give a different narrative. Um, you are like, wait a minute, it's not like that. There was actually, um, when you mentioned Mwanga chasing, or chasing people off land, these are not stories that we always hear. And these are not stories that are uh, told. Um, probably my colleagues uh, in this room and those online will uh, offer a different view. So I liked when you talked about land, those who own land in fish, and then those who own land, land. I, I um, quite intriguing, and which aligns with what was bothering me is, so we are talking about an island. But what makes it an island is because it's in actually a lake. And other than when you say the land in fish, definitely fish are in the lake, um, but for most of the time, um, 
the talk is silent about the lake. And I, um, so I thought the lake is quite important in Buganda's history. The lake is quite important, probably missed it in that narrative. And what did those people, what did the Baganda, what did the islanders and then the mainlanders make of the lake? And if we look at the lake, if we focus on the name of the lake, um, in the map, of course, uh, this is a recent map. The, in the map, it is Lake Victoria. But then we know that before it was Christian Lake Victoria. I would say that's the Christian name, just like ourselves. We have um, our pagan names and then Christian names. So Lake Victoria also has a Christian name and then Naru Valley. So I'm wondering if we focused on Naru Valley, does it change the story? of how people, of how the islanders understood the lake and how um, those on the main, including the Kavakas, understood the lake. And what would that do, what would that understanding do to the narrative that we have on the table? Um, then to a very interesting actor, Kagwa, um, and I'm trying to keep within the five <laughs> share minutes. Um, so, Kagwa, how do we read his actions? Um, and he has replicas in other regions of Uganda. Personally, I work, I work on Nampore, so people would quickly reference Baguta, who actually took after him to write the history of Nkole and uh, Kole. So how are we to read the actions of Kagwa? Um, where is, how much of Christian influence uh, is behind his actions? But also um, studies of people like Kagwa, they have called him a collaborator. And then you have others like Mwanga being called resistors. But I find, and this is not something that uh, like you directly talked about, but I thought uh, it wouldn't hurt to hear you speak about it. But in the book, I think you mentioned something like it. So I find it linking to, and you are not calling him a collaborator, but I, um, I want to think of people like him as people who sought to benefit from the situation. Um, call it, uh, they were manipulating it. And somewhere in the conclusion, I had the opportunity to look at it. Um, you actually highlight the idea that um, the authoritarianism and brutal ways of the colonial administration often hide its importance and compromises and weaknesses, including intellectual weaknesses. And I'm like, yeah, isn't this true? Because I, I have added before that the well, system was actually not as strong as we think it was. And so if we look at the actions of people like Kabwa, then it starts making sense, in my opinion, to start saying, oh, colonial, uh, a strong colonial um, government, because they did um, help it, manipulate it if you want for their own ends. But um, I think we need to rethink uh, ideas of corporate uh, uh, resistor. They might not uh, help us so much. Um, quite a number of issues, but I think I want to leave it at that. Um, okay, maybe this one. So if we are to talk about the weak, a weak colonial system, if we are to talk about people like Kabwa, uh, to be able to make such a, a comment, like I just said that, yeah, we can actually push back and say colonialism was not all that strong. Is it a question of sources? Is it a question of reading particular sources that we can be able to make those claims? Or is more, is much more than that? Um, then, this should be my last one. You talked about 
when we go to the intellectual history, sort of uh, writing history and the Bataka version of history, which you, if I had correctly, um, referring to as like a new history. Um, so when you mention a new history, it means that there is an old history and probably the old history was the one that um, Kagwa uh, provided. And we know that he actually uh, wrote that if you like dynastic history uh, of, Kabua, of Uganda. Now, recently I was uh, going over again for the second time, Christopher Rigri is uh, in state and is one of the four values that actually we need to look differently at Kagwa's work rather than uh, look at it as the history. Um, then we, we want, so using that, I'm doubting whether we want to look at Kagwa's work as the old history because he himself, especially given what he is doing, what we learn from this talk and from that book, what Kagwa is doing, how much, how can we be confident to say what Kagwa presents to us is actually old history. It actually would also be new history or might, you might find what the Bataka were presenting. A new, new, history. A new, new, new history. Okay, okay. Um, so I will leave it at that. I, I don't want to contradict myself, but this is very fascinating. Uh, looking forward to having the English version. Uh, like Edgar said, we can try and uh, work on our French to read the available French version. Thank you so much. If you want to see if you respond to as much of that as you want, then we open for questions or sure, whatever. Um, so, uh, land grabbing, there are mentions of land grabbing from about Kagwa colonial sources from 1901, I think, or not, just after 900, but I'm not sure what words. Uh, I think the problem is I'm using translations, so we'd have to go and see the words are, which are used in, uh, in the copies Kagwa made. And they're usually saying you stole. With the translation is usually you stole our land. Uh, so it's more misrule. Thief. Thief. Yeah, yeah. Thief. a bad chief, a uh, misruler and a thief. But they accuse them of everything. You know? um, I probably should have said that wealth and fish rather than land, uh, fish land. That's more my English, which shows uh, betray me. Uh, I, I mean, the, these people, they, they speak in terms of land. They, they have butakas, which are very wealthy, but their wealth comes from the fact that they have fishing grounds. But the problem is, it's very difficult to understand how the, the fish was orga fish, fishing was organized uh, before uh, before the sleeping sickness and before the introduction of uh, the Nile perch. The, 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 the ecological system of Lake Victoria has been so destroyed that we have it's very difficult to know what was going on before the sleeping sickness. So we have people like a little bit Kagwa, the Musk but they do descriptions of saying this object, this object, this object, this object. There's no, not a real understanding of the, the dynamics, but we can be pretty sure that you can't just go fishing away. I mean, the fishing is an organized activity and the people who were controlling that fishing were either the clergy from the temples, like say the temple, the, 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 temple, the, the god of the uh, Victoria of Kassa, or other gods, or the clan leaders, and probably both because actually they're the same. Uh, not exactly the same, not the same people, but they're all types of mutakas, they're all related. And the Sisi Islands are different in the sense that um, on the mainland, the, the, the batakas are not coordinated. But on the islands, through rituals linked to uh, re religious rituals, they are coordinated. They do meet regularly and they take decisions. It looks like if it's religion, but it's actually uh, the, his group is a coherent group. That's why they're also powerful. They're powerful because they're, they, mass, they control the gods. And so it's not wise to have a conflict with the gods. The Kabaka often have conflicts with the gods, but usually they lose. Or at least that's how it's remembered. And then we see it very clearly. So very clearly in the case of uh, Abusi, 86, 
Wonga is mad with the island. They've killed some of his cooks when he was passing by. Or maybe it's just a pretext he wants to loot the place. Uh, he raids it. He wants to give it to one of his friends, which is a pay. And uh, then the Gabunga comes and tells him, well, if you give him to this friend of yours, he, you're going to ruin the boats because he knows nothing of navigation and the boats will be ruined. You won't have any navy. You need to keep the... And so that gives them strength. They have a technical skill that you can't just replace them by, you know, you can replace a banana, a banana plantation by somebody else and just give it to somebody else and you'll know how to take care of it. But these, these people are controlling the gods and the boats. They cannot be replaced that easily. So that gives them a huge strength. And he, do, he does that. He doesn't give it to his friend. He gives it to the Gabunga. To have, the Gabunga being the, let's say, the administrator of the fleet, the head of the lungfish clan, the administrator of the fleet. And the, um, I would like the, 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 it's about the, the weak colonial system. So there's been debates about how powerful and weak the colonial system is. There, there's a very classical debate. They don't speak of shoestring. Uh, well, there's, there's a whole debate about it. Uh, I think the sources, the colonial authorities always pretend they're very strong. So since we rely a lot on colonial sources, they're pretending that they decide everything, they control everything, and that people have to obey them. And they're very, they're strong. I mean, they, they can kill you. And they, they could demote Kagwa if they wanted. And they, they, they're, they're very powerful. But that doesn't mean, I think it was Lance who said this. Uh, how did Lance say that? We transform, uh, what, what is it? Strength into power, something like that. Uh, so they need to rely on other people. And these people, people like Kagwa, they're not only puppets. They have their own agenda. The agenda, which can go the same way as the British or can be different. I mean, Kagwa knows that the British are powerful. He's not, he's, uh, but uh, he's probably capable of getting his own agenda uh, respected better than the British can. So we shouldn't neglect the power of some of those colonial actors, which are in the system, but have their own agenda. Uh, and I think, uh, who, I forgot the name of the author. There is a book uh, who deals of the 1940s who shows that the, 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 once the British lose the, the, their alliance with these big chiefs, they actually lose control of Uganda. And they have, and eventually they have to go. There's all sorts of problems. But at that time, when the, the oligarchy and the British are on the same boat, they're extremely powerful. When they split, they all lose, more or less. Um, so I think that there's a bias with sources. Sources, there are racist sources which consider that, of course, a white man has influence because he's just white. Of course, it's not, can't be. They, they, they're, um, they're, they're trying to please their, their, their superiors. But when you see how the thing works, you realize that things, their power is much more divided. Um, there was one before that. So I, I don't think uh, that there's a, there's, it's always the same problem. The, the um, comparison, you can't think without comparing. It's just, if you don't compare, you're not thinking. But sometimes comparison can be a comparison when they're never two same situation. And so if you call Kagua a collab collaborator, it does show part of the reality, but it hides other parts of the reality. Um, the first thing, and then it's anachronical. I guess uh, that we're looking at him with our, our today's eyes, not looking at him with the 900 eyes. Um, I think in the case of Kagwa, it's probably better to compare him to these, um, uh, let's say, uh, I, I, when I think about Kagwa, I think about Mazaran, the Cardinal of Mazaran, who's the prime minister of the uh, infant Louis XIV, in both cases, the regents. He's the most corrupt man. He becomes the richest man in Europe because he steals so much land, so much wealth. So you do have, but he's still serving the state. When Louis XIV wants to marry his daughter because he's in love with his daughter, he says, no, not his niece, he's a, he's a virgin. He, can't, he, he has nieces, not, not children. Uh, he says, no, because 
as a king, he has to marry higher. So, and then he does build the state. I mean, so the, these guys are, have their own interests, but they, they don't, that doesn't mean that they forget the interests, what they think is the interests of the state. They do have a, you're going to hate me, because he, he has a vision. <laughs> um, so he is, uh, he is trying to, to um, he, he wants to go somewhere, but he thinks he's a wonderful, he has a very huge ego, and he thinks that his service deserve huge, uh, reward. He's not modest at all. Uh, and that, so I think there's this question of honor. Uh, actually, it's probably more honor than greed and prestige. Uh, but of course, that could be. And of course, if you compare Afrokagua to Mazaha, there also are very big differences, as if you compare him to, uh, since we're staying with French parallel with Maréchal Pétain, there's also great differences. <laughs> Um, so these comparisons help us to think, but they also corner us. Um, I think I, did I forget something? No. No. Thank no. you. No. Thank you for your questions no. and your comments. Fantastic. So we uh, we have uh, we're going to allocate ourselves a bit more time to do uh, technical issues for for questions and comments uh, from within the room. It's the old fashioned way of just raising your hand. Uh, online, if you want to use the raise hand button or type your comment in the chat, I will uh, um, just call on everyone as soon as I uh, see a hand. Um, and yes, yeah. maybe, and maybe just first introduce yourself uh, as your hand. My name is Robert Sule, uh, historian of the Danish. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Kagwa and Yunnan Suga uh, exchanged land because they were from the, both from the Mamba clan. No, no, it's uh, Kagwa is from the Tsenene yeah. clan. It's the Gabunga who's from the, the Mamba oh. clan. Okay, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Uh, second, you make a dichotomy between uh, two histories presented at the Commission of Inquiry land. Mm -hmm. uh, one of Uganda as an absolute monarchy. And then another vision or history of Uganda as a constitutional monarchy, where the Karaka shares power with uh, clan heads. Um, wouldn't you, and, and you seem to suggest that both, uh, neither of the two is the official, the actual uh, history that occurred. Uh, but can we borrow the um, methodology of David Schoenberg and, and uh, conclude? That the constitutional monarchy cardinal defends the correct one. The yeah, what, what? Which one? The constitutional monarchy. Is the, the correct one? The correct version of history, given that the, one of the Kabaka's names is Sabata, the head of a clan head. Yeah. So he primes with the Paris to the constitutional monarchy. Of course, that changes later. So wouldn't you conclude that in some ways, uh, the people who argue at the uh, inquiry that Uganda was a constitutional monarchy part of the point of view. Thank you. Okay, I can answer that. Um, so models are never always reflect a reality, but never even the best model doesn't reflect it completely. So it uh, doesn't mean that they're completely wrong. It means that they're just a simplification of, of what was going on. Um, but I wouldn't say constitutional because there's no constitution. It was more, uh, let's say, with power just shared, shared between the Kyung and the, and the Batakas. Um, and so that, that the question is more a question of chronology. What period are we talking about? Um, and so sure, David's sources are linguistic and usually refer to fairly old fairly old period. Let's say he often talks about you know, 12th century, 13th century, 16th century. century. Now, these days he's been getting much closer to the present. Uh, so it's more a question of the origins of state in the Great Lake region. And there, there are debates and it does seem that uh, the, the, the kings were often linked to uh, religious duties or what they call networks, network, networks of power, if you take a Kodesh of words. 
there wasn't as despotic as it becomes later. So that, that the, the, the roots of power are more, they're not constitution, but more equalitarian or more, as you said, primus uh, inter pares. So, but then when, what, when is that? The question? No, no, well, the Chintu, I don't even think Chintu exists. <laughs> so, <laughs> for me, Chintu is a god <laughs> from the 18th century, but it could be from the, or the, the idea is the origins. The origins are always tricky because when, when, when the do things start, there's always something before it starts. Mm -hmm. um, but what my argument is, I'm not contesting that plants did not play an important role in Buganda, let's say in the 17th century or first half of the 18th century, probably did play a very important role. But what I'm saying is that why everybody is saying that they played an important role and they were replaced by the Wakumbu and Watongo is um, also because these people are contesting Kagwa or supporting Daudi Chua, um, are from the islands and they're not remembering the 17th century, which may be the same. It could have been the same, but same. It's never, I mean, societies are same and different, you know. This, but um, but th that's not what they're remembering. Their argument is actually remembering how the islands were ruled, but they're not saying we want to go, Uganda to be ruled like the islands. They're saying that the islands were the past of Uganda. So it's a rhetorical question. Of course, Probably plants played an important role uh, before the, the, the before Mawanda, for Kabaka Mawanda. Uh, but then we are the, the, this history, you know, very linear history. Plants, despotic kings with important chiefs, then colonial rule. Uh, that, that model is made uh, first uh, said by I think Morris Carter in 1906. It's always taken, but it's very um, evolution. Uh, Evolutionist. evolutionist and it looks good but we have to be careful with neat evolutionist history because we know that actually history is messy you don't go progress from uh, that's uh, okay if you if you people were thinking in a hegelian thing you know with barbarians kings then civilization and they, they, they they're thinking like that in, the, in those days and many people are still thinking like that but it can be that way. You can have, I mean, not that I believe like Hegel that there's a hierarchy, but you can have societies that have no kings, then have small kings, not very powerful, then very powerful kings, then modern, modern states. That could have happened, but mostly history is messy. So you can imagine that one point clans were important, then there's a big civil war, you have warlords which are important, and that mess up the clans and reinvent clans, saying that they're the clans, but actually there's some, they're functioning differently. Then you have a religious cult that comes and becomes the king, and then the king is killed, and we have clans again. The, the, I'm not saying it could, it could have been very uh, progressive, but most likely it was much more messy with progression in one sense. Of, oh, you like, you like fairy man all the time, don't you? <laughs> um, fairy man shows that very well for the Shamba kingdoms. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the Shamba kingdoms today, you think they never had a king, but they had a king. And so the, we, we, we think evolution, in an evolutionary state of mind, we're all obsessed with it, I'm pro me too. But when we see it, we should always caution ourselves. Thank you. Yes, uh, David is, uh, I think if you speak loud enough, I think they should be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yes. Uh, I, I wanna thank uh, uh, Professor Leda for this. For oh, writing this book um, perfectly now, because as we discussed and said, um, we are getting we are getting the richer in our understanding of uh, how when we bring the periphery uh, to destabilize the center, then then it's a little bit messier and more complex and fun. Um, I also want to thank the discussion for really uh, really good for this question. I have a couple of them, but maybe you can them to three for now. And very quickly, well, so one on the methodology, I, I was just asking myself, I had the benefit of reading the introduction in French. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, there's something of historiographical novelty uh, in, in what I'm in what really doing here. And, and I want to ask what do the sources which um, 
you go inside the um, green. Green to this bureaucratical uh, 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 debates on, on Uganda, the way it has been uh, 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 historicized and uh, contested, uh, particularly Contra Luaga Lugigo's 2007 book, who, who it, it, to great length, tells us the, the whole struggle of, 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 of Ghana land from the point of view of, uh, of, 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 of the Republic. And, and we're telling us also the contestation from the point of view of the Islanders. I want to see how much uh, we bring to that case. And then, two, uh, and it's come, it comes out at, at, concluding, uh, at the concluding point of the thought here in this presentation. Uh, the making of, of private property on the one hand and indirect rule on the other. And I want, I want, to, I want to ask you very directly what, how much sense should we make of indirect rule as, as so far theorized by uh, uh, other historians? Uh, it seems to be this case of Busu, he stabilizes the understanding of how indirect was indirect rule and how, how direct was the indirect rule. Um, uh, when we when we throw back the conversation of private property, it seems to me that uh, 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 apart from Christopher Magdalian distinction of bifurcation and, uh, and, and, and 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 the room through, there's a lot more here, and, and uh, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, how much less Magdalian is not seeing as it's already the direct rule, which allows you to see. Uh, finally. Finally, uh, be very interested uh, to, to remember a uh, perhaps sleeping sickness. Uh, you, you, you often refer to that as an ecological crisis. But the story, which within which this ecological crisis is narrated, is much more a political crisis. So, uh, uh, a very provocative question would be. Uh, should we read also sleeping sickness as a political crisis that has been invented by the political class of the time and, and less of a, a natural current that just showed up and then destabilized political problems? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you to, or do you want me to concentrate questions or to answer your Well, there were quite a few there actually. <laughs> so if you want to take those, but. Uh, um so I I'm not sure well I I don't see innovation very easily. I wish I was better at making them basically I think what I'm doing is just looking at the text carefully. I mean the Holy Hanscom has done a great work before before I did on this topic. The only thing I did was just to, to look at a smaller scale than what she did, and that's when the, the lake came. Because at high scale she can play this lake. But that uh, when you go local, more local places, suddenly you realize that there, there are other things going on, which is more normal. Everybody always finds new things to move on. So I think it's really the, the text from, uh, uh, I don't know it's probably in English. Uh, that's what we're brainwashing translate. Um, text, studying texts, just going to the sources and pulling them to part, to pieces, uh, and then crossing the sources. Uh, in this case, it, Chosen the, the topic because of the sources. So, in the end, I didn't choose them as well as I wanted because I was happy that I knew about 86. I'd seen in the White Father sources and other sources about the 1886 that Ray and Lucy. So, I thought there I had to like, go, go back from 1886 to more recent periods. And then, but the, 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 I really wanted to focus on the and the survey map stuff was really what was fascinating me initially, but actually that survey map was probably not the best to the find. There were much better survey maps if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, even just across the lake. The maps were much better than the ones I had. So, and then the end, what was fascinating was having the maps to understand what because the top maps it's a bit confused. The the people. Fighting about the land and describing the land in the 1924 uh, land inquiry. And then from time to time, we had a passage from the White Father saying, Ah, oh, the woman has taken the, has cut his mile on Lucy Island and chased other captives. Or you have uh, descriptions on um, 
Well, just being able to, to look at these different sources and sometimes they, they answer each other. Often they don't. Often you go, ah, what does this mean? I don't understand. But, uh, so I, I don't think there's anything very, there's, it's not very original methodology, as far as methodology, like micro history. Clearly, okay, I am influenced. I like the Carlo Levy, uh, how this book was translated in Italian, but micro history, Italian micro history is fascinating. And he is actually working on that history. Uh, so you need a small scale to understand. But if I had taken the whole of Uganda, which would be fascinating, it was too complicated to take the maps. Mm -hmm. So you have to take a small, small area because you can't master the maps. Or probably you would need very computerized systems. It would take a lot of time. It could be done, but it would take a lot of time. I'm not capable of doing that. Um, so it's, uh, it's more just you know, regular statistics. <laughs> Less, less imagination about uh, about Longa, Longa Nigo's uh, book. Unfortunately, I don't have the voices of the book. I have the voices of small chiefs, not the lowest. And women absent, Bakuti are absent, fishermen are absent, slaves are absent. I have the, the ones that are just above them, or not just actually, they're not such small chiefs, they, they look small, but they're. Fairly important. They're important enough to send their children, their daughters, to get married to to the Kalaka. They they have relatives. They never go to court because the Basis do not go to court. The Basis uh, stay on the lake. If they have to work for the king, they'll go and uh, to Gaba. They, they, they have plantations around Gaba around those areas where they could keep the the, the, the naval squadron the king wanted there, but they don't go to the most of them never go to the capital, and if they go, it's very occasional reason to once a year to bring fish from the castle or things like that. And so actually, uh, they, they don't um, you know, it's something that it is a lot. So I don't have I, I don't have a fisherman. I don't have this, I have this kind of small sheep who never go to court. So we never hear because our sources come from the court. The, the, Actually, Kabbalah is at the court, the missionaries, the British, they're the court, those are the people they see. Mm -hmm. So, that, those, those are very interesting. That I only uh, have seen it before. Um, so, that's a problem. I mean, I have a different voice, I don't have all the voices. Well, the only thing I hear about them is sometimes I, I, I know that in 86, they captured people. The, the, everybody fled when the Kabaka attacked the island. It seems that they weren't warned. Quickly enough, so the, the they captured all the, the the women and the children, killed the men, captured the cattle. We have a couple of descriptions of people fleeing by boat and being captured uh, once they reach the run on Tibia around that area. And so, so that some are kept, but this whole boat of refugees lands there, and their kinsmen which are there, and they keep the children, they steal the children. They say to free to free them to to make them Christian. They're, they're, they're stealing and they send the adults to, to the village. Um, we know that the sleeping sickness, we have a couple of clips with the sleeping sickness, which is terrible. Sleeping sickness is terrible. People are just dying when they were there. So, what's, it, what's funny is the Protestants are very, in the 1890s, we have Protestants also. And after they had an agreement, the Catholics come back. Protestants disappear because they fear the sleeping sickness, and the Catholics are there visiting people that die in the day. So they continue coming, and so we have descriptions of them. But we can see that the, the people are, are terrified. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, so we spoke about sleeping sickness. Yeah. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons to explain why the sleeping sickness. Uh, suddenly appeared because it was not a region which had sleeping sickness. In fact, yeah. the sleeping sickness is a colonial one. It appeared all through colonial Africa. Yeah. It's not the same when you surprise them. It's basically that they were, uh, before colonial rule, sleeping sickness was contained in some areas. And suddenly, colonial rule just disrupted the, the, the protection. In this case, we know that the lake was shallower. That the people were overworked, so they couldn't clear the bushes. Uh, that the population was falling, so they were much more 
wastelands for the for the floods. But however, uh, you never so there, there are ecological changes, and the fly just spreads, and then people are circulating because of the general compost, because of the, all sorts of things. And so they bring in the disease if it wasn't there. We don't know if it was from Sudan or from Kenya. We don't even know. There's even theory disputing to know if it was the Bodhisians or Gambians who did sickness that came to Uganda at that time. At that time, there's the debate about that. Uh, so there, there are right, the ecology is changing. I mean, that's also why I found interesting to figure out where was the choice. What was it? Uh, but the way it's managed is political. I mean, we just the COVID was just there. Mm -hmm. There's a sickness, but the consequences of decisions people take, mm -hmm. which sometimes are misinformed or very authoritarian, and that's. That has been complicated. So in this case, but I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not going to do lots of people say it's poor. The, the, the British panic, they didn't know what to do. And the only thing they have is force, because that's the only thing they have in abundance. Just like my government, when you have policemen, they have the doctors. Uh, so you just evacuate people, force, force them to go. It's not they didn't want to just exterminate. It wasn't a genocide in the sense that they weren't trying to exterminate the buses. It is a genocide in the sense that they did mm. because these poor people were living on the lake while they were dying in uh, By taking them out, maybe they survived. The, the doctors are not even certain of the impact of those quarantine on the, on the, on the islands and the glaciers. We can see that it's actually the real team of colonial power. It's the first time the people in this region, probably the Soviet, also experienced colonial power. Up to now, they, they knew of it, they knew the British were there, they were powerful, but they had an experience of the bureaucratic power of the colonial state. And there you just take people from where they are, burn their houses, sink their boats, park them somewhere else, and guard it. And there's also, it shows the efficiency of the Ghana chiefs, which are very efficient. They obey orders. They take their people, they move them, move them. It shows that they but then it also shows that the sheep believed they had faith in those measures. But the people were very upset. They did when you see the, the, the suffering, the description of the suffering of being moved away from home, people were walking, they never walked so long in their life and losing their toenails. I mean, it, it's a horrible history. Um, so it's political and since that. Uh, health policies are political, but they react to circumstances. And then it's also political in the sense that that crisis is made by the destruction brought by the colonial conquest. I don't know if you see that. Well, it's man made and not just political. Thank you. I think we can take one more question if uh, I can check uh, online as well, or I can ask the question. Yes, please. Thanks for the interesting presentation on how we do it from philosophy. Uh, this I do not have the privilege of reading the book. All I can say about it is from what I have had to do with And the story sounds quite a bit. This is where part of my fear is the very question around the civilization. Where your answer would be, I don't know. Not the time. It sounded like you were answers all the questions. But I chose the one. I chose I chose the one that I was going to go over. I didn't I didn't want to go into details. I mean I could go in some cases I'd go on for pages and say, well, well I don't know. But orally I didn't think that was how to say it. Didactic, <laughs> and and then orally, uh, I'm more uh, more sure of myself. I don't think there's going to be precautions orally. First of all, because my English isn't good enough, and then because I don't have footnotes orally. <laughs> but uh, no, no, that's the point in history. Is you can always have. Actually, this book was terrible. Each time I was writing it, I thought I had something, and then it fell. You know, you're feeling 
you're trying to get something in the cupboard, and you're putting it in the cupboard, and it falls on you, and you have to put it back on. I, that was a feeling I had the whole through the writing of that book. I, each time I thought I understood something, I found something new, and wow, I had to re reimagine it. But yeah, of course, uh, you can you can understand the sources differently, as always. You can find new sources, uh, specifically for the, the I probably haven't gone far enough with fan histories. We've got a couple of them, but for the, the history of the, the island, um, let's say earlier history of the island, there will probably be a couple more I could have gotten if I spent more time in this island looking for them. Uh, there clearly there is many, many false. But the question is always um, not that I'm right, but I usually do have arguments explaining how I got to that conclusion. And you can use them back on me and tell me uh, that, that's not the way to understand them. But uh, yeah, as I said, I write with hundreds of people footnotes, but I don't tell them, I don't speak. Mm. Yes, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to say, and thank you very much uh, for this fascinating presentation. And so I after that was the fourth one, I wanted to just say something about the motivation. Mm -hmm. Like, what was you to do with Pale, the pen work, and just about how, uh, like, great faith is very different from the typical kind of history of the land that, uh, that you read. Um, but I also wanted you to speak a little bit more about that unique, unique video. Always a part of chance. You know, you don't decide in advance, you get taken. Uh, so, the, the, initially, it's because I, I like the Holly Hansen quite a lot. So, I've read her several times and we discussed quite a lot. I usually, when I read Holly Hansen, I don't agree with her. Then I read her again and I agree with it more. And the third time, I agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she was mentioning this, she mentioned Lucy very briefly, and I'd read other sources, different sources than she had read, and I didn't understand it the same way as she did. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this whole, I mean, her, her thesis is mainly dead by the uh, built through the use of the Bataka land. Uh, that's the main source of the whole page, even though she's much more ambitious. Um, and then in, uh, in 2003, uh, I was working with uh, some other people who wanted to work on land, and they hadn't worked in Uganda before. They were trying to figure out where to study, where to start. Uh, and the, the point was trying to find a place where history would be markers of history. Uh, you places where you'd have sources that didn't start in 900, but that could go further. And Lucy was one of those places that I thought with the yeah, 1920s. Well, if you're working from present, you have the 1924 land inquiry. I had these things in the, the letters, missionary letters, Kagua for, for the 1880s. Uh, so it looked like an interesting place. At the time, I had my mastery of Kampala was bad. <laughs> I hadn't realized that jams had become so bad in Uganda. So going from Kampala to Tizu was. Complicated when you have to cross the river, the lake. It's not so long, but still you have to cross it. And uh, the children to get to at school. And so, well, we dropped, we dropped to Lucy Island, and we chose to actually get there. There was a temple on Monday, the house, standing Sasuga now. So there were other sources. And uh, then they did. I didn't work so much on that place, but I'm supposed to. That's what I should be doing now. But I'm not doing. But uh, so there was this kind of leftover, yeah. and I went, we, I, the still we went there to visit, and it was interesting. And I had a feeling there still I could do something with it. I thought I'd do a small article, then they became overweight article that nobody understood, and then it became a book. Um, 
but it's not the usual sources I use. I, most of my work, uh, I think, what distinguishes me from other historians is the white papers. So I have found that actually in the end I do find quite a lot of stuff. Let's say if you want to understand the, 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 the 900 agreement, very studied subject, I mean, very important, very steady. But the White Fathers are the ones who are most critical initially, but they don't publish it. They write it in their diaries, and they're very, initially, they're very tough. They're very, their, their judgment is very severe on the 900 agreement and the system, how people suffer, how the, it's done in a very un, unjust way, how people lose their land. How, um, and then they realize that they're getting a lot of land relationship. <laughs> but initially, the diaries, they're, they're the only one who criticizes them in the. So, Kagwa doesn't, but you have yet those. The, the, even the Bataka movement, they're not contesting the Marla. They're saying you gave it to the wrong people. But they think that the Marla should be theirs. They're not saying the Marla is bad. They never say the Marla is bad. They say it should be ours, it should be yours. Um, so there you, you have a period where the, the, the white fathers are looking at what's going on and say, hmm, this is this is a mess. The only one who criticizes my, the, that period is uh, Bishop Tucker, which is the Protestant, but he's criticizing it very, um, he's criticizing later, and he's actually trying to camouflage the fact that it was a mess because he's one of the ones, it's all his prince who, who got the land, he's one of the ones who broke the agreement. So he says, yeah, people had to, lose, had to be chased from their houses, but it's okay, it was because they wanted to live close to their butaka. And then he shows it as a big joke of people walking on the streets, people from Chicago meeting people from Voodoo, and go, everyone going to the opposite direction. It's a big, it seems funny and a joke and things are not serious. It's much more dramatic than the White Father does. So that's an example of some of the aircrafts who come back from time to time. But the main focus was in the but okay, like maps. That, that's part of, part of our training to like maps. Um, the deer. Yeah. Ah. There's lots of questions I can't answer for the deer. <laughs> First of all, I was hoping they still made that deer, but they didn't forget its existence, even though it was you know, serving the king was important. It was a very Important function to, to, to every two months. There's another clan, the chair of another clan. Every two months, one brings the deer. But today, you can go there, they, they don't remember it. And they don't remember that they had a special recipe for it. But it's not famous for deer anymore. They probably make deer, but nobody notices that it as being uh, great. So there again, maybe it had spent a very long time. As a, but the people have changed. The people who live there today are not the there's a few yeah. Mutakas, Batakas, but most of the people are new people that come from elsewhere. And those just say they move all the time anyways. So even if they've been stable, they would have been moving around. And actually, most of them are new migrants. The land was opened up for pineapple probably in the 90s a lot. So then this, but maybe I would have found some more if I stayed longer. Uh, the fact is, there again, there's something I don't know. I know that Kisaba makes beer for the king. But I know that Kabwa claims that he already had his brewer beside there. And if he had a brewer there, maybe many of the other chiefs had a small, you know, small estate for their own consumption. Like they had small estates for fish, and they're also small. The, the, the big chiefs had fishermen working for them, so small estate for fishermen, small estate for beer. Or would have, so they probably were more of them. Um, but I assume the king had the best. You, you, Okay, so I'm, um, I, I dream about that beer. I wish I could drink that. <laughs> but they're really thoughtful. They really would quarrel all the time. As far as we can go, the, each new Gabunga uh, would seize that land. They'd go to trial since it was for the Kalaka. They said, okay, if you want the beer, you have to give us a land. Mm. So they'd get, get it back, or they'd have somebody forced to protect them. Both. But beer, yeah, I guess alcohol is important for humans. Um, but there's so much I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, for all that you do and don't know. Thank you. You shared with us uh, it's been a really uh, wonderful uh, seminar. So thank you. Uh,
Well, thank you, Christopher, for the comments and everyone for being here. Um, just a, a note that we will have another seminar in two weeks with right. uh, um, the Hops on um, uh, well, economic history. Uh, I'll have to look at the title uh, uh, here, but if, you, if you're not, if you don't receive announcements, I would like to take a look the next um, otherwise, uh, thank you everyone online and, um, uh, hope to see you next time.